Good day, and welcome to the Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation's web talk, How Social Media Contributes to Extremism and Anti-Semitism, the first of our new series entitled Extremism and Anti-Semitism. We will be exploring the various forms of extremism, both historically and currently, that are affecting our global world with particular impact on Jews. I'm Andrea Spindle, Executive Director of CAF and your host. We are well into our third year of presenting virtual programs, and I want to thank our growing list of listeners and thank many of you who send me feedback and questions, suggestions, comments, and even criticism. I appreciate hearing from people who have listened to one of our webinars or read the CAF Bulletin. I'm happy to engage with you, and I can assure you that I respond to every message. We also need and welcome your donations, which enable CAF to continue to both educate about anti-Semitism and to combat it. Donations in Canada and the US can be made online at caef.ca. Being forced to go virtual has had many benefits, including expanding our reach globally. So while I don't yet know where you're listening from today, we do have listeners from time to time from Australia, Britain, Switzerland, across the US and Israel, France, Germany, New Zealand, South Africa, and the UAE, and of course, from across Canada. This is aiding tremendously, is aided tremendously by our wonderful co-sponsors and today's promotional partners, which include the Clarion Project, the Lodger Center Congregation, the Lawfare Project, Club Z, the Matatias Project, Israel Activist Calendar, Atlanta Israel Coalition, Americans for Safe Israel, Karut Canada, Americans for Peace and Tolerance, the Canadian Institute for Jewish Research, the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem, Muslims Facing Tomorrow, Israel Action Committee of East Bay, Beth Tikva Synagogue, and the Israel Committee of Sonoma County. CAF is dedicated to exposing, countering, and preventing anti-Semitism in all its manifestations and from its many sources. We do this with education, countering the lies, the propaganda, and malicious acts against Jews and the Jewish community in Canada. We stand up for Israel, bringing knowledge and facts to bear in the battle for the hearts and minds of both Jews and non-Jews who are subjected daily to a barrage of anti-Israel media and the biased indoctrination of some educators who have forgotten the meaning of critical thinking in education and the integrity in teaching truth. We work to prevent harassment and discrimination by bringing forth complaints to authorities such as the police, the registration bodies for teachers and for social workers and others, the academy itself, engaging with faculty, governing councils, boards of education and politicians. CAEF supports both the adoption and the implementation of the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. Without full implementation, the resolutions are meaningless. We encourage everyone to ask their elected members at all levels to create an action plan that supports the adoption of IRA and then have an annual accountability report. Corporations, NGOs, and governments must all have a plan and be held accountable. Anti-Semitism is always the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the deterioration into chaos of any society. CAF needs your support in this struggle especially since we are one of the few entities that focuses on anti-Zionism as the main thrust of anti-Semitism today. Please make a donation on our website or send a check to the address posted on our website. It's now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. Rabbi Richard Green began his career studying at the Asha Torah Yeshiva under Rabbi Noah Weinberg. Shortly after the 9-11 attacks, Rabbi Weinberg explained to Richard that while he had devoted his life to Jewish outreach, there's an imminent threat to Jewish lives as a result of radical Islam. While the world needs Jewish outreach rabbis to save souls, the world also needs those who have dedicated to the mitzvah of pikuach nefesh, nefesh, saving a life. Richard heard his calling and started the Clarion Project and a life committed to exposing and reducing the threats of extremism to create a safer world a world safe for Jewish people and all people. In 2006, Richard co-founded the Clarion Project, an NGO which is nonpartisan and whose mission is to expose and reduce the threats of extremism to create a safer world. 
the focus is primarily on the urgent threat of violent extremism and domestic terrorism. In 2017, Richard founded the Clarion Intelligence Network, and through this work, he's become recognized as a national expert on domestic terrorist activities, frequently consulting with law enforcement officials and presenting national and regional security brief briefings to select audiences. The organization has played a substantial role in domestic terrorism cases, providing expert intelligence to, author to the authorities. The work of the Clarion Project is helping America recognize and understand the reality of not being, that has not been conveyed by the mainstream media. It's my pleasure to welcome Richard, and I invite you to put your questions in the Q&A, and we'll get to some of them after his presentation. Welcome, Richard. So yeah, I wanted to thank, uh, firstly, Andrea, thank you for putting this together. Thank you for everyone involved who has been helpful, uh, all the co-sponsors of the event. Uh, I noticed that one of the co-sponsors, and I, of course, I want to just mention her, uh, is Muslims Facing Tomorrow, Raheel Raza. Uh, I hope that she is on the call, uh, and if she's not on the call, she's out there uh, uh, doing what she does best. And I'm a big believer of hers and her mission. We worked very closely in the past with Raheel um, uh, and with others that I heard mentioned. So uh, I wanted to go ahead and begin a slideshow. We started Clarion Project 2006. We started, we started by making a film of Session, Radical Islam's War Against the West. Uh, it was back then. It was my co-founder uh, Rafael Short and myself. And uh, since then, we've made a bunch of other films, and we have an amazing website that is clarionproject.com.org. Uh, a lot of people who subscribe to the website. If you're not subscribed, then you should go ahead and and uh, consider doing that after this presentation. So, with our films, we've reached to about 125 million people. Obsession, which is our first film again, that was the most well distributed documentary in history with about 130, excuse me, about uh, uh, 30 million copies of it made. So we've also been the Honor Diaries, which Raheel was in, uh, was the feature documentary direct TV for two months. And it was also chosen one of the best documentaries on both Netflix and iTunes. And all that was uh, you know, great. We really enjoyed doing all that work. And while we were doing it, we also started figuring something else out. Some of our researchers that were doing research either for the website or for um, uh, the films began going into chat rooms in which they were exposed to very radical thought. One of the chat rooms they were in, really this picture that you see up here, this changed my life and really the trajectory of Clarion. The reason is, is because you'll look at the, 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 the terrorist on your right hand side uh, in October of 2019, he ran over a bunch of pedestrians in New York City. And uh, unfortunately, there were too many acts of terrorism. But what made this one special to me, that was that we uh, were able, two months beforehand, to on one of the chats that we were on, find the picture on your left-hand side. So that's the ISIS flag, it's the Freedom Tower in the background, and it's the actual bike path that terrorism happened on. And when we gave this to law enforcement, it was part of a much bigger uh, 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 threat. It wasn't just one person. However, it was many people. And presumably law enforcement did a pretty good job of mitigating a larger cell that would have been on a much larger act of terrorism in that location. Uh, and, but they weren't able to get everybody. So since they weren't able to get everybody, I'm able to, unfortunately, I am at least able to show you this as an example of what really kicked us off to get into full gear and in creating the Clarion Intelligence Network. Now, I know many people here are not Americans and different laws, of course, are in different areas. Uh, but the FBI and their website says, our investigations focus on, on the unlawful activity of the group, not the ideological orientation of its members. So when they're conducting investigations, they have to be very, very careful on how they conduct their investigations. Now, this is the FBI. When one is not an American citizen, it goes into the area of the CIA. Now, they are do not play by the same rules, but if one is an American, an American citizen, these are this is the rule book. The FBI has to play by this rule book. So anyone who has an ideo ideological orientation, excuse me, the focus of their, uh, of their investigations 
are not an ideological orientation. Now we're gonna come back to that. This will make a lot of sense soon. I'm gonna actually skip past this slide. So in trying to explain the larger threat to those people on, on the call, on the attendees, I'm gonna get into a little more detail about the larger threat, and then we'll zoom in to what Clarion Project actually does to stop it. But this is a very important part and it's gonna to come together very well, I hope, by the end of the presentation. Uh, E.O. Wilson, and I got this, uh, I found this quote from an, actually a, a Joe Rogan podcast and then a subsequent documentary that I watched. Uh, and it's brought down there. The fundamental problem with humanity is the following. We have Paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. So that's an interesting quote, but what does it really mean? So let's talk about this. What was a great godlike technology that happened in the past few centuries, right? Perhaps the greatest godlike technology for the internet, and that was the railroads. It went from the East Coast to the West Coast. It was the most amazing thing. You could ride the railroad and it created a boom. The question I'm gonna ask everyone on this call is, how long did it take two billion people to ride the railroads? And the answer is, if you ask Google, I don't believe you're gonna get an answer. I don't know if two billion people have ever ridden the railroads. Perhaps it's been 5 billion, I don't know. Perhaps it's been a 1 billion, maybe it's been 500, I have no idea. But I know 2 billion people is a lot of people. And I also know that if you go onto Facebook right now, right, you will be in a, in a community of about 2 billion people. There are more people who have signed up and are, so to speak, adherents to Facebook than there are Christians in the United States, in the world, right? Think about that. We all know that we hear, we learn in school how powerful the Vatican is, how many resources they have, and we all know how large Christendom is and, 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 and the, 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 the history, the good, the bad, the great, the ugly. That is less than the amount of people on Facebook. Now, do we understand how to use this godlike technology is the question, right? We have the godlike technology. Do we have the ability to use it effectively? I'm gonna leave that as a question for now. Paleolithic emotions, we're highly vulnerable to suggestions of danger. So in our minds, the part of our mind that is the oldest, that make us, when you hear a loud sound, you are trapped to look up. You hear a loud sound behind you right now, you're gonna look up, you're gonna look around for it, right? That's our lizard brain. That is the oldest part of our mind and it's the one that's perhaps the most hardwired into our reality. So what ends up happening is that when someone is trying to basically hijack our brain, they can get straight into the amygdala, into this part of our brain, and we won't even know it's been hijacked by creating a sense of fear. And there's also other ways to hijack it. And I'm, we're gonna come back to that as well. And then we have medieval institutions, right? The medieval institutions are that, that the, uh, an example I like to think of, oh, well, let's get back to Paleolithic emotions. A good example of that is let's imagine, and this again, I got from the same individual who was on that Joe Rogan podcast. I thought he was just, um, uh, maybe I'll provide a link afterwards. Maybe you all wanna hear it. Um, he says the following. He gives a great example, uh, uh, or maybe I, maybe I added this example, I'm not sure. Regardless, imagine that you're in a restaurant and you, you're so excited. You're in New York City, you don't usually go there and you love a salad. You love having great salads and you order the salad and the salad's $50 and you say, that's okay. So everyone right now, imagine to yourselves that just the best salad you could possibly imagine. Just imagine it's great because it's a Caesar salad, whatever it is. Now imagine as the waiter comes over, he sneezes a little bit and you see him just like touch his nose, right? And then you see he hands it to you, you're already a little bit freaked out. And you're like, okay, I'll still eat the salad. And then out of the side of the salad, guess what happens? Comes up a little cockroach and starts crawling across the salad, right? Crawling across the salad. Now, it only goes to about a quarter of the salad. It doesn't touch the whole thing. It doesn't touch the whole thing. So you spent $50 on the salad, you're gonna eat the entire salad other than the parts the cockroach touched, right? No, you're gonna throw out the whole salad. 
right? That's because we've been so disgusted and that is those Paleolithic emotions. That's an example of it. Hardwired, again, it's, 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 it's hardwired in there. And then the medieval institutions, that's the government, as I was saying before. They're very slow and ineffective. Imagine a, 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 you know, a very large uh, sea vessel and it's going across the sea and it sees you know, oil uh, tanker and it sees a mile ahead of time that there's something that's gonna hit and it can't turn. It can't turn or an aircraft carrier. It can't turn in time. Even if it sees its demise, it still can't turn in time, right? That's what we're dealing with with the medieval institutions. Now, let's get into the heart of the problem that I'm going to be explaining today. If you talk, if you're talking about Facebook, the person who actually created the artificial intelligence, and this will go for uh, every social media platform from TikTok um, to, 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 to what's to, to any of them. So they all have gotten addicted to what? Spreading misinformation. What, how? Through artificial intelligence. So I can, I'm happy if, uh, if anyone would like um, sources, I'm happy to send this as I can see, like, this is a long article written by the MIT Technological Review. This is the individual who basically was behind the creation of the algorithms that have created, that are the, the backbone of the artificial intelligence. He says himself in this article that it's gotten out of control and uh, Facebook is, is just using these, this, this AI in ways, or excuse me, these algorithms in ways that are just absolutely, just, I'll, I'll use my own word, uh, they're the, the, the far from moral, uh, very much as a, they use them because what they wanna do is they wanna maximize their returns. So what they end up doing is they use the AI or the algorithm is so smart, it helps people, it helps it. So it creates a situation where you'll stay on the site for longer. So you'll see there'll be more uh, ad revenue. Now, an example of this, this is with YouTube. And the example is, if any of you watch YouTube, or, or uh, you'll oftentimes see a video and then another video will start playing and another one, another one, another one. I don't know if any of you have had that experience. It will suggest videos to you. So the question is, how often are those videos pretty much spot on? Right, they're pretty good. Like it's, it's, if you ever put, you put in the wrong algorithm, you're like, why are all these stupid videos coming up when I really want to see the other videos? I want them to put back in that other algorithm. And the question I'm gonna ask you guys is, does your, if you're married, right? Or, or, or you know, if you're not, does your, does your mother or your father or your spouse, do, do they know what videos to suggest to you as effectively as Facebook knows what videos to suggest to you? And the answer is, for most of us, absolutely not. So how is it if you've been married for 30, 40, 50 years that Facebook, or excuse me, YouTube in this case, Facebook does the same thing, is actually understands what videos to send you better than your spouse would know what videos to recommend to you? And the answer to that question is very simple. There's billions of dollars that have been put into the uh, uh, methodology on figuring out what your personality types are, what your personality type is, and then click and then look at your history of the videos you watch. And then as a result, recommending to you the correct type of video. So you have literally billions of dollars being invested in order that to, to beat you, right? In this, in, in, under these circumstances. And beating you means that you're gonna stay on the platform for longer. Now this becomes much more concerning. And uh, uh, there's a doctor, I believe his name is Epstein, who uh, I initially originally heard this information from. He says, and this is a Silicon Valley review, troll farms reached 140 million Americans a month, a month on Facebook before the 2020 election, right? So there's many ways that you could get hacked here. Your brain can get hacked, right? The example that he brings is he says, let's say you type in your URL, um, uh, something political, and let's say you are a, um, uh, uh, supporter of, um, uh, I don't know, let's say, let's say Biden, okay, um, you're a supporter of Biden, and you want to know who to vote for, and you're just trying to get some information about Biden, so you're going to put B-I-D, and then it's going to auto-populate for you with two or three suggestions, maybe a few more, and those will, suggestions would commonly look like Biden is great, Biden is wonderful, Biden is fantastic, and you say, oh, 
okay, and you, know, you don't even realize that you saw that, but you go ahead and you click on one of the things, buy it, and it's fantastic. Now, let's say you are the exact opposite and you want to find out about Donald Trump and you want to, to, to articulate to your friends why Donald Trump is so great. Well, you'll actually find as you put Donald Trump, you'll get net worth, you'll get affairs, You'll get so all these suggestions that you wouldn't think anything of it, but they're actually negative suggestions, right? So the social media platform, excuse me, Google in this example, has be really started hijacking your brain without you knowing about it because it's putting these results in that, that are auto-populated. And that auto-population will trend heavily towards the, the Democratic Party. Now, if you think that's a great thing, fine and well. If you think it's a bad thing, then fine and well. I'm just giving information over because without, if we don't talk, if we can't openly talk about the concerns and the issues we have, we will never come to solutions. And if we have a democratic process and you believe, and you're going on Amazon, or, or you're going on uh, 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 a search engine, Google, in this example, thinking that you're, it's a, it's a fair player, you can get equal information, then it's just not true. Now let's take this to the next step. If you would look at the top Christian American pages of that same time period, right? You would say, you're just, imagine yourself being a normal Christian fellow and you just wanna learn more about your religion, your ethics, the morality that's taught you. You say, I'm gonna go on Facebook and I'm gonna find different Facebook pages that are gonna teach me about it. So now imagine, put in your mind's eye, that there are these massive warehouses in Russia. And in these massive houses and warehouses in Russia, you have a bunch of guys who are pounding on computers, creating fake identities called avatars, right? And those fake identities have actually produced and created these pages. And guess what? If you were going to zoom in October 2019, the top 16 Christian pages in the United States of America were all run by Russian troll farms. Okay. Now that should be a wow to everybody. I'm going to repeat it. Usually I'm in front of an audience, so I get to see the reaction, right? So I'm just going to repeat it because I don't know if it was clear enough. The Russians ran the top 16 Christian American pages on Facebook in 2019. Now think how many of your children, not just yourselves, but your children are going on Facebook for information. And now start figuring out, and now you have to ask yourself the question, perhaps the Russians and the Chinese do this as well, Perhaps the Russians and Chinese love democracy and they just want to see America blossom and they want the rose of democracy to, to, to bloom. And that's the reason why they're investing hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, into creating these troll farms. Now, we all know that's probably not the case, right? So then you have to ask yourself, what is the reason? Then you have to ask yourself, hmm, if the reason is for nefarious reasons, then perhaps. This could be a reason why our society is getting more fragmented. Perhaps it is, because if the main place in which young people are consuming information is on social media, and social media, these social media sites that you think are being run by normal American Christians, and you think you're getting accurate information based on who's running them, if they're really being run by the Russians, and they're just little plants being put in there, right? Little plants being put in there, that will eventually get you to the pages and other areas in which you're going to find more radical concepts, then you'll probably be spot on in understanding why society is becoming more radicalized. So you could say to me, Richard, at this point you say, Richard, you know, it's awful that the Russians are attacking, um, uh, trying to attack the, 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 the minds of Americans, especially American Christians, but it's just American Christians and they're not so powerful, right? Perhaps you're thinking that, right? And I would say to you, no, 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 no. It's also the African-Americans. It's also the Native Americans. It's every major demographic in the United States of America. There are Russian troll farms who are trying to hack into our brains. So you might say to me, hey, that seems like a big issue. So I have an idea. Why don't you kick off all the bad players? right? Any extremists, anyone who's espousing bad things, just kick them off. And I'll say to you, perhaps that's a good strategy, but let's have a conversation. Because if you kick them off the American platforms, they're just going to go to the Middle Eastern and the Asian platforms. 
everything in red here. And you think the Middle Eastern and Asian platforms are going to police this more effectively than the American platforms? I don't think either are going to effectively police them. But I perhaps trying to curtail free speech is not the way to go about this. I'm going to remind you now of the um, uh, FBI's own admission. Our investigation focused on unlawful activity of the group, not the ideological orientation of its members. So why does the Terror Intelligence Network exist? Because terrorism and anti-Semitism start as an ideology, start as ideologies. So the FBI freely admits that they can't look, law enforcement can't look based on ideologies. So this is what we're able to do. We're able to create a flashlight and then that flashlight is able to find bad players. And as that bad player starts to run away, we're able to say, hey, you're, you're a buddy, you're a friend, we're like you. And then once we start a conversation or we're able to uh, look at their Facebook page more thoroughly, we're then able to find out their whole infrastructure. And I'm gonna show you what this looks like. Here's an example of someone who was a bad player. And I'm able to show this to you because it became, uh, 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 well, uh, we'll get to that. If you look at the top left-hand side, this is January 23rd, 2018. His name is Damon Joseph. So Damon Joseph is becoming a, a recent convert to Islam. This really happened. And before that, he was a decent enough guy, let's presume. But as he becomes a convert, he's not going on to, he decided for whatever reason, mistakenly not to go on Rahil Raza's site, because if he had, then he'd be a great citizen. He decides instead to start following ISIS propaganda. And you start to see the different types of things that he posts, you can read it yourself, including the recent synagogue shooting. And he's talking about that freely. ISIS blog on your left-hand side. As he becomes more observant uh, in his version of observance, he become, you can start to see no mustache, big beard, calling the Jews in awful names, uh, becoming a, 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 as we say, Talmud of Awaki, right? A student of Awaki. Very, very, very bad guy. So this individual was actually sentenced to 20 years in prison after he got, uh, after the FBI began investigating him in September of 2018. And at that point, he engaged in a number of online conversations. And those online conversations ultimately led to an agent trying to sell him weapons. And when he took possession of the weapons, which were absolutely, uh, of course, they were not usable, that's when he got arrested. Now, look at the date, September 2018, Joseph's engaged in these conversations. And look at the bottom of here. 723 is when we began our, we, we are actively, actively monitoring him. So we were able to get this information directly to law enforcement, and that's what enabled them to open up their investigation. So we track any possible extremist who has um, uh, violent motives, who we think is going to do an act of mass violence. So this is an example of a over 100 people in one um, uh, platform that we started following. And we started following them uh, a few weeks before the school shooting in, um, in, uh, in Texas. As we began following him, and we're following them, we realized, wow, this is, this is a big issue. Since then, we've been doing a lot of uh, delving into these potential school shooters. Here's an example of one, okay? But this example, is, we're gonna, I'm going to show you perhaps another example as well. This is going to show you how Twitter, in this example, is, does something that is going to blow your mind, okay? So this guy, um, this is a school shooter on your, uh, he has a picture of a school shooter. He says that his faves are the Sarnayev guy, brothers, right? And others who have done school shootings. He's not new to the TCC, but he's new to the TT, 
TCCTWT. And these are all just acronyms. Uh, we don't need to know all of them, but they're violent. They're, they're about violent. They're types of violence. So then, what does Twitter do? Twitter says, let's say for me, I'll personalize it. I like tennis. So when I go, I don't really do this, by the way. But if I go on Twitter, I I tweet about tennis. So what Twitter going to do? Its algorithm is going to show me more tennis players. It's going to want to connect me to my people who are pre presumably I'll start talking to. I'll stay on the platform longer. So once they'll make more money off of me. So if you're a school shooter, what's Twitter going to do? You got it. Twitter is going to refer you to other possible school shooters who are in the same infrastructure. So Twitter is not just providing a forum in which you could possibly find kinship, partners, others who have your motivations. It's actually finding those kinships, friends, and possible motivations for you. So in this case, look at the, we're gonna zoom in on one in particular. So say, oh, okay, you might like this person. Oh, I do like him. Let me go to his page. Hey, there he is. I miss Vlad. Vlad's a school shooter. And he says all these types of things that are so disgusting. You can read them yourself, the type of things he's posting. But I really want to be his friend. And I want to be friends with other people that are his friends. I'll be his friend. Now I'm his friend. And his friend, and he says, I love Eric Harris, right? Who's Eric Harris from the Columbine shooters? TCC shooter lover. That's the, 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 this, what the, uh, the acronym is for potential school shooters, right? And then in this bottom one, the real, and we obviously we redacted it, my full-time BFF, I do not condone, we see this all the time, they start saying we do not condone these things, but they're all phrases and catchwords saying that they do. So I love Eric Harris. Okay. Now you might think that people wouldn't post statements that are highly incriminating online, right? But what we'll do is, we'll give the information over to law enforcement and this is what a evidence package looks like. I, what you find on these, uh, when, it, when it's, you know, the vast majority of them are guys, uh, and we're talking about school shooters, so most of them are teenagers in this case. If we're talking about radical Muslims or far right wingers or far left wingers, it'd be a very different demographic. But in this case, there, many of them, it seems like they're very demasculated. Um, uh, there's a tremendous amount of homosexuality uh, uh, so they all, most of them have a crush on Eric Harris, right? Uh, who's one of the Columbine shooters. So they view him as being attractive and, they, and he was very effective in, uh, unfortunately in doing the Columbine shooting. So you can see, right, you can read yourselves. I'm in love with two dead murderers and look at March 20, uh, 23rd. Uh, I worship school shooters. I love Eric Harris. I'm about to turn into N-I-G-G-A then like, believe me, this is, this is one of the more team, and that's why I'm showing it to you. I see much worse every day, okay? My analysts see far worse every day. How fun would this be? The actual um, uh, inside closed caption television of the, Boogaloo, uh, of, of the uh, Columbine shooting. Um, uh, he says booga booga at the end. Booga booga is... Uh, we're not going into the complexities of the Boogaloo Boys, but it's their calling, uh, which is, let's say, the far right wing group, but that's not 100% accurate. We can come back to that in QA if anyone wants to, to speak further about it. This is a, an incredible one. I would have killed, if, if Dylan and Eric, the Columbine shooters, would have uh, had bombs, they could have killed 600 people. This one, he's actually threatening to shoot somebody. This is what's in his camera reel. This one, he's saying that he wants to do crazy stuff together. He's trying to find someone to do it with him. I'm pointing something out here. This has 51 likes, four reshares, and 10 direct conversations. So let's understand what we're up to at this point. It could be in these circumstances, I'm not saying it is, that Twitter has recommended so many kids to get together. They made this huge group in which there's so much kinship and so many like-minded values that they have now created a situation that uh, 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 you have this huge amount of individuals who are now in direct conversation with one another 
um, and figuring out how they're going to do their school shooting. This one, he actually says, I am a shooter. Okay, the weapons, the anti-Semitism, the knives, so on and so forth. All right, this you might find disturbing, but this is all over the place. This is only five seconds. This is one of the things they all post. Then we're going to get into the financial impact of the terrorism. And I have four more minutes. We're going to open up for Q&A, right? So if Damon Joseph had, of course, the loss of life is the big issue, right? But if Damon Joseph had actually done his act of terrorism, it would have been similar to the Pulse nightclub shooting, except for it had been in probably three synagogue, synagogues in the Toledo area. And my analysts have estimated that it would cost $385 million. DJ, so I didn't show you, um, if he would, he was going to, he was going to do some very awful things in LA. If he would have done it, it would cost at least $500 million. We helped stop him. Now we know that 96% of the offenders, right, have produced written, written or videos about their intentions. So we know that their information is out there and we know that law enforcement can't track it effectively, right? In every case, bystander expressed concern from the behaviors of the attack. So what we're able to do with the intelligence network is we're, well, I'm going to get past this slide just because out of, out of time concerns. So what we're really trying to do is we're trying to figure out the best way and the most effective way to stop mass acts of terrorism. Now on my team, uh, we've been able to put together a pretty amazing team. Uh, uh, one individual uh, who, uh, his name is Matt, he was running ICE with their 20,000 employees this time last year. He helped get out El Chapo, or excuse me, help out uh, arrest El Chapo, who's the head of uh, that mission. I also have a guy named Jim Penrose who works for me or works with me. Uh, he's the one who was the top NSA tech who was behind the technology that got Bin Laden. So we're producing something very, very special in order to try to put this kind of iron dome around American society. And of course, the Jewish society, the, 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 the non-shocking statistic I'm gonna tell you is 80, roughly 80% of the intelligence packages that we produce, unless they were produced 500 this year, will be people uh, uh, who have anti-Semitic, uh, who are explicitly anti-Semitic, right? So yes, they might be on the far left or on the far right. They might be school shooters, they might, whatever they might be but they all, 80% of them all share the hatred for the Jewish people, right? So that is my time. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, your last comment answered the first question that I had, which is uh, how often is the is anti-Semitism associated with terrorism? And, and you've answered that. It's pretty frightening. Um, I have a couple of, of questions I'll ask before we go to the audience. Can I, can I, can I comment to that? Yes, please. A month and a half ago, maybe I'm wrong on, my, on the timing, um, but not too far off, there was a shooter in Buffalo. That shooter in Buffalo went and shot up uh, an area that was highly African-American. So uh, he was also an eco-terrorist. That's what he called himself, an eco-terrorist. Here's the rub, guys. Here's the rub. This is how this whole thing is expanding, and this is why I, I wanted to stop you. I'm sorry, because it's a very interesting they give you a whole different understanding perhaps of how anti-Semitism is now starting to happen. Um, though he was on the far left and an eco-terrorist, what does an eco-terrorist in this case, what is the bullseye? The bullseye is consumerism, right? Because they wanna stop consumerism because that's what's destroying the world from their perspective, fine. Who are the greatest consumers? Certainly not a bunch of African-Americans in Buffalo from his perspective. Rather, it's the Jews, because the Jews have create the companies that create the consumerism. Now, if you look at his manifesto, it says it directly. I'm not making this up. Why he decided, he said he hates the Jews the most, but for whatever reason, he decided to go and drive to Buffalo to kill uh, uh, the African, the, the, I think it was, you know, uh, like, I don't mean that, I should have remembered the number, let's say it's 20 African-Americans. Now, uh, that's a travesty in its own right, but we have to understand, even the eco-terrorist, right, who you wouldn't think necessarily would hate the Jews, he writes in his manifesto that he, the Jews are the ones who are the most hated. I don't think we should be surprised, but uh, it's obvious that mainstream media did not report it that way. 
Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I did a little research on Clarion and maybe not surprisingly found that you're a target from several sources. Um, I'm not surprised. What can you tell us about organizations like Bridge or the Southern uh, Poverty Law Center, which claims that Clarion Project is distinctly anti-Semitic? Well, the Bridge Initiative is from Georgetown, and it's uh, and Clarion. You guys can all uh, will we'll provide links. We made a film called Covert Cash uh, that attacked how much money is coming on coming from two American universities, from the Big Five, uh, as as we refer to it: Russia, China, Qatar, UAE, and Saudi Arabia. So we did a report. We found that over the past ten years, ten billion dollars is given uh, from outside uh, countries. Now, of course, the Big Five are the nefarious ones. Once we released those findings, the number ballooned to 18 billion. Okay, they found these universities found eight billion dollars. How do they find eight billion dollars? What do I mean by that? Every time a gift of two hundred fifty thousand dollars or more comes from an offshore location, it has to be the reported Department of Education. Fine, but that wasn't happening. So once Clarion came out with that article, we see that the, 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 these universities started getting the, the questions started coming, and they start and they and they went back into their tax returns. And uh, uh, they found these uh, universities found this money. Now, Georgetown is one of the universities that has been funded the most by Islamists. So, is it any wonder that the, not every part of Georgetown is bad? Not everyone who graduates Georgetown has been affected by this. But there, when you're talking about what's happening in, 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 in their Eastern studies, it's been highly affected. And it was actually Prince Talib, if I recall correctly, who gave, I think, $30 million uh, to their Near Eastern Studies Department. And that's the same from Saudi Arabia. Uh, he was actually one of the people that the Crown Prince uh, put in quote unquote jail. He's the guy who gave the money because he, uh, the Crown Prince put him in jail because it wasn't really a jail because he was an Islamist, right? So I'm not supporting the Crown Prince, but I'm saying this is what happened. So, so, so Georgetown accepted money from him. And then Georgetown writes articles about Daniel Pipes and about Richard Green and about Clary and about everybody else saying that we're all the bad guys. Well, that's the source of that is crooked money from a, according to the Crown Prince, an Islamist. And that, then the organizations of the United States of America who want to denigrate Clary or other organizations who are in this space will use that as the, um, the, the stone in which they build everything off of. Georgetown University says, right, and now they have a valid source. So that's what happened. Uh, that's the Bridge Initiative, and that's what's happened with many of these organizations. Now, I do want to note uh, um, the SPLC, Southern Poverty Law Center, um, took Clarion uh, off their hate group list. So not that Clarion should ever have been on their hate group list, but you could imagine how well, how would I say this? You can imagine how hard it is to be taken off a list like that when you have an organization that is, is somewhat politically motivated, if not highly politically motivated. So it means that we should never have been on it in the first place. When they finally realized it, they took us off. Right. Amongst many other organizations that should never be on it as well. When you say that um, the, the um, certain federal agencies can't come after people for their ideology, can you speak a little bit about the ideological issue of, um, like, I'm not sure how to frame this, but it looks like some of the attacks against uh, certain organizations are claims that they're Islamophobic. So Clarion is said to be Islamophobic, even though I see how many Muslims work with you and support your work, like Raheel. I'm familiar with others like Zudi Jassar and Ayan Hirsi Ali, and yet there are claims that you're Islamophobic, and I think that's an attempt to discredit you. What I also saw is the definition used of, of Islamophobia is extreme fear of and hostility toward Islam and Muslims, which is so broad because it says not just about the, the faith, but about all the people. Is there a better definition or any definition, or is this something that you concern yourself with? I'm just pushing forward. Um, uh, and getting bad people, uh, uh, tr trying to get them to, trying to put bad people in situations where they can't do acts of mass terrorism and try and get as many movies out there as possible to dispel all the darkness. Right, okay. Um, who is funding 
Are there specific organizations that are the major funders of some of the activity? You showed us that on social media, a lot of the, um, the messaging is coming from these troll farms in China and Russia, and I assume there may be other countries. What about the funding behind some of the activities, the terrorist activities? Are there certain sources of that as well? Um, listen, there is certainly, uh, when it comes to organizations like BLM, not that every person who is in BLM is a terrorist, right? Not that, uh, that's just not the case. Not that every single Antifa member is a terrorist. That's simply not the case, right? However, there are a number of people in BLM and in Antifa who have nefarious uh, uh, ties, and they have uh, very clearly tried to take over areas of, uh, of American cities. So we, it's fair to say that a certain percentage of Antifa and BLM are not necessarily great citizens. Do we know exactly where that funding is coming from? No, we do not. Can one speculate where the funding is coming from? Well, there's a lot of articles out there that everyone can read for the speculation, but I can't say right now as a, a perceived expert that anyone knows where the funding is coming from. No one, as far as I know, has been able to dot their I's and cross their T's and have enough concrete evidence to bring it to a congressional hearing. Okay, one of the um, di most divisive um, ideas in America, and I think now in Canada too, is that of racism. And it's perceived by major politicians as a systemic problem. Could it be the Russians or the Chinese are actually manipulating social me media to create fake racism to divide our, our countries? Absolutely not. No, 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 no. It's not that they could be, it's that they are. Oh. That's the plan. That's the plan. The plan is that the United States is the world power, mega power, as long as it's called something called the United States. The plan of the, the people who are doing the Russian troll farms, the Russian, the Chinese, whoever else, is to make America not united, right? And that's what's happening, right? You, you, you have examples of Russian troll farms uh, telling one side of the uh, people who are against uh, um, uh, Islamists, right, uh, who are well-intending people who are just against Islamists, but they are not well-researched people, telling them one thing, that there's going to be a, a, um, a rally on the northeast side of, of, of Taylor Road, and then you see the Russian troll farms telling Muslims, right, that there's going to be a, a, a rally on the other side of Taylor Road, and they both show up at the rally and they, and, and, and they have counter rallies. That really happened. It was all based on Russian troll farms. Wow. I have another question here from an attendee. Given the volume of the types of accounts that you've just shown us, the school shooter um, fanatics, for example, how do you distinguish which are the necessary ones to report? And are you reporting individuals or just providing social media accounts to law enforcement? Well, our methodologies, I don't want to go into great detail, um, but the internet is, is, is a huge place and our analysts do the best jobs they possibly can based on the limited resources we have. Um, we're not going to get everybody, uh, but we are going to get some people and getting some people means occasionally uh, stopping school shooters and stopping synagogue shooters and stopping acts of mass terrorism in New York City. Okay. We all know a little bit about the Elon Musk Twitter um, debate, debacle. I'm not sure where it's landed. I think there's some court cases. Would his intent to deal with, to enhance free speech be a positive or a negative? If everything you're showing us is called free speech, then we can't ever take it down. Well, no, no, you can take things down. Uh, Twitter has an it has a moral obligation to stop proliferating and uh, conjoining possible terrorists and their data scientists are plenty smart to figure out an algorithm that will stop it today. Uh -huh. So that's not being done. That's not being done. Oh. The same goes for Facebook and every other uh, major platform, meaning that if you're online and you guys see uh, uh, some, anyone like I just showed you, like, sure, take the screenshots, send it to the FBI, send it to Clarion, whatever, hope that you're going to get some you probably won't. But let's hope you do, like positive action. Um, what you can do is you can report it to Twitter or Facebook. And then take note, does it get taken down or does it not get taken down? 
And if it doesn't get taken down after they've been warned, why don't you go to your local media stations and say, hey, I reported this to Twitter, so I know that they saw it and they still didn't take it down. Why didn't they take it down? And that's a valid question and more people and more, and more people have to do that. Right. I think uh, in Canada, it would be CSIS for those Canadians listening, correct? Um, yeah, it sounds, it sounds like you know a lot about it. What about the local police? Is some of your reporting to just local police when you come across some of these sites? Uh, well, yeah, again, the SIG methodologies aren't worth getting into, but we are able to report it to um, necessary parties that's taken uh, extremely seriously. I want to share a message with you from someone who says, Shalom from Afghanistan. How would should we fight against anti-Semitism coming from Iran or Afghanistan or it's taught in the schools? That's a biggie. I don't know if you have a thought about extremism in Afghanistan, but I think it's important for our viewers to hear that question. Uh, I, I think that uh, um, you should get in touch with Raheel Raza to answer that question. Okay, we can do that. I'm sorry, I thought I had no insight there. <laughs> Um, is there a way for people to send information about anti-Semitic Facebook pages directly to Clarion? Absolutely. Um, so uh, we'll provide you with a link um, uh, or an email address that you can send uh, whatever you guys find. And I think that would be a great outcome, uh, if, if none other, and hopefully there will be others of this, of this meeting. Uh, if we have, uh, let's say, uh, whatever, let's say we, we have X amount of people on this Zoom call. Um, if y'all, I'm not saying, no one, I'm not promoting, nor do I believe that anyone should be a vigilante. But if you happen to start seeing, if you happen to see things that are highly anti-Semitic and there's a trend, it's not just one post, it's someone posting one after the other after the other, then please share it with us and we can see if we feel if, that we can uh, do something with it. Okay, well, when we share the recording, which we will with everyone listening, we will make sure that we include the contact information. Yeah, and please also share it with NTOC, the National Threat uh, um, Operations Center. Um, you know, Clarion is not like, I'm not willing to take the obligation of, 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 of saying I can get it to the correct people every single time. So we, sure, we might be more effective. Uh, I hope we're more effective. I'm sure we're more effective than almost anybody, but it doesn't uh, mean that you shouldn't be sharing it with law enforcement. You should. I got that. Do you have any encounters with the victims of terrorism such that they are a voice that assists you in some way? We made a film called Kids Chasing Paradise. Um, we started launching it right before COVID and we kind of pulled it back. We're gonna go into a more formal release in the next few months. That film itself is about um, uh, a bunch of women who have gotten together, who have lost their children uh, to acts of terrorism. Um, uh, uh, most of the women, most of the people in the film, their, their, their children themselves became terrorists and they were either killed um, uh, uh, be fighting for ISIS or whatever, right? Some nefarious, nefarious cause. Um, and then there's one fellow who's in the film whose father was murdered by a Palestinian terrorist and he speaks about it. So, um, so yes, we are able to. Okay. Um there's a question here about funding for Clarion. Are you a registered charity or nonprofit? How, how are you functioned, are structured? We're structured as a standard 501c3 in America, which means you get maximum deduction for any gift. And um, I was speaking last night and uh, I figured out a way to say this very well, um, uh, if I must say so myself. And that is that uh, these school, we, what, when there's usually, let's, I'm just use for simplicity, uh, 10 posts a day that we see about uh, um, a given topic, um, a synagogue shooting. Like, well, let's say there's 10 a day, that's a fictitious number. And then all of a sudden it shoots up to a thousand a day. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a critical mass enough so that the police will not be able to stop every single person. So, you know, something's gonna happen. I, I don't, we don't know the number, we don't know the ratio, but something's gonna happen. I'm telling you that the school shooting pandemic in the United States or that's endemic in the United States of America, there's so many people posting. I shudder to think that we're going back to school in the next few weeks. I'm not saying we shouldn't go back to school. We should, right? But if anyone has a wherewithal um, uh, uh, and the heart to give, to donate to Clarion, 
and we're ultimately able to hire somebody in the next few days or few weeks to lend a, a hand to the analysts that are working on the school shootings, I will tell you, we will stop school shootings. Not all of them, but there will be school shootings that would have happened that will not happen. Well, that's an important message. And I'm pleased to encourage all of our listeners to make that donation, to be in touch with you. Um, I'm gonna give you one more question before we wrap, I think, Richard, and that is, is there a difference in terms of whether we should be concerned about the extreme right or the extreme left or Islamism? I know that there are various organizations that seem to focus on one or the other, not necessarily all three. It sounds like you're monitoring all three, but is there a difference from a Jewish perspective, one that we should be more concerned about? I won't speak from the Jewish perspective. I, I'm, as a Jew, I'll speak from the Jewish perspective, not as a rabbi though. Um, as a, you have to ask a rabbi as much more knowledgeable than myself. Uh, the Jewish perspective on that question. What I, I do characterize it um, uh, the following way, I, I, it was actually a donor of ours, um, first name is UOC, I'll say his last name, uh, who, 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 who helped me with this insight. He's the one who presented it to me. Um, and it's one that I feel is basically true. You do have right-wing anti-Semitism. And it, I know sometimes uh, when we get in our own, own, own ecosystems, we feel like this is being pushed on us, that there might not be as much right, uh, right-wing anti-Semitism as being portrayed. I, don't, I can't say there is or there isn't, but I can tell you there's a lot. There's a lot, a lot. It's, it's, it's staggering how much is out there. That's the right-wing anti-Semitism. And that's a concern. And the way they work with the Islamists, I don't think I have time to, 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 to make the connections there, but they do uh, very intensely. And then there's the left-wing anti-Semitism. The problem with left-wing anti-Semitism is sometimes they're Congress people. So they have real power. But they're a totally different type of anti-Semitism, right? And that's a very powerful type of anti-Semitism. It's not the power of persuasion, it's the power of power. And the power of power is much stronger than the power of persuasion, though we can't ever give up the, and see the ground of the fight of the power of persuasion. But the power of power is still the power of power. And then, so, and then you have the Islamists who wax and wane. And we saw uh, uh, in times of ISIS, we've seen in times before that, when they feel as if they're on the ascent, then their viewpoint is that Allah is with them. And when Allah, Allah is with them, then they will uh, uh, do more acts of terrorism uh, domestically because they'll know that Allah is happy and that Allah will give them the ability to succeed from their perspective. I'm not gonna say which is the worst, what I will say is that all three have to be monitored very closely. Right. Well, we thank you for doing that. Firstly, thank you for um, giving us this wonderful presentation. But more importantly, I think, thank you for taking on the risks and the challenges that you personally do and that your team at Clarion Project does. We very much appreciate it. And I think maybe today we'll all learn to be a little more vigilant and attentive to what's going on and maybe less likely to follow the... Uh, the, um, the memes that come and the messages that come from looking at any of the social platforms that any of us tend to follow. So thank you very much. And thank, thank you. you everyone for listening in today. Be well, take care. Bye for now. Bye for now.